If I had to describe this laptop in just one word, it would be confusing. Why? Well, it's running an i7 CPU that's just four cores and eight threads, and would have been called an i5 last generation, see the i5 10400 or 10300 age. It's also using an RTX 3070 that performs admirably despite its meager 80 watt CDP, and my model is running a stunning 240Hz display that you seemingly can't buy, at least here in the UK. Confused? Yeah, so am I. Let's have a look at this thing and see if we can work out what it's all about and who it's for. Of course, first, if you haven't already, consider subscribing for more videos like this one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. This is the ASUS TUF Dash F15, a moderately budget laptop sporting a headline grabbing spec for its relatively low price tag. I mean, to the uninitiated, reading RTX 3070 and Intel i7 means that it must be pretty much the, the best, right? But I guess that's kind of the point though, isn't it? Because the reality is pretty far from it. In CPU heavy games, running just at 1080p, in a game like Cyberpunk, the F15 struggled to hit 43 FPS average, and in Watch Dogs, it couldn't even break 50 FPS average, both of those running without ray tracing. In less CPU bound games, the 3070 can stretch its legs a little more, hitting just shy of 100 FPS in COD Modern Warfare and just a hair over 100 in Fortnite, again with ray tracing off. But for context, the Acer Concept D7 Easel, a laptop that's dedicated to creative and graphics workloads, which happens to have an RTX 2070 Max Q, mostly for acceleration, and a 10875H, will run Watch Dogs Legion at just four FPS slower compared to this F15 with an RTX 3070. Heck, even in Fortnite, it ran a little over 90 FPS, meaning only 10 FPS less than this. And the reason for that is what I can gently phrase as deceptive branding. I've already harped on NVIDIA for their naming scheme for this generation in my desktop versus laptop GPU video, you should definitely check out in the cards above, but the condensed version is the 3070 that's in this isn't even the same core as the one you get in a desktop 3070 card. Their desktop card has 15% more cores and runs 34% faster clock speeds meaning just looking at the clock speeds and the cores alone, it's 54% faster. All the while being visibly called the same thing. It's still marketed as a 3070, although you might see laptop next to it, which while that is technically better than nothing, it still doesn't really help the uninitiated. Anyway, turns out that Intel are doing it too, as the, this i7-11370H is a quad core that at best matches the last gen i5-10400H, although the lower 35 watt TDP in this might argue otherwise. Last generation, Intel's lowest end Milwaukee i7 offered six cores and 12 threads, whereas the higher end one offered eight cores and 16 threads. This time, four. But it's still an i7, they still get to put a sticker on the box and to say i7 and convince people that this four core i7 is just as good as the six core i7 they would have bought last year in the Strix G15, an RTX 2070 based gaming laptop that's pretty much at the same price as this. Yeah. Using a term like i7 to convince people who don't know better to buy a product that is markedly worse than the last version is deceptive at best. If you want to see why, take a look at these CPU benchmarks. Starting with Cinebench and the single thread results, you can see that the 11370H here is pretty fast in, in single threaded performance. It has a ever so slight lead over the 10980HK and um, still beats the 10875H in the Concept D7 easel. It is beaten by the Ryzen 1500HX and I expect it to be beaten by a lot of the new Ryzen family, but it's still pretty impressive. 
But when we switch over to the multi-thread results, you can see the discrepancy. The four cores and eight threads that this has available are only marginally faster than the 9750H from a couple generations ago, and are handily beaten by the six and eight core variants, both from Intel and from AMD. This performance, well, drop, is made very clear in the more multi-threaded tasks like rendering and blender, where the 11370H is the third slowest chip I've ever tested, only behind what is essentially an ultrabook and an ultra-low power ultrabook. Even compared to the 9750H in the Blade Studio, it's not quite as fast, and again, if you look further up the list, there's a pretty sizable gap in performance to the 8-core options that are available from the last generation. The same goes for Blender and the Gooseberry Render, where again, it's pretty much only slower, uh, the only chips that are slower than it are the 1165G7 in the Blade Stealth and the 1185G7 in the Lenovo Yoga. But comparing, like I said, to the, say, uh, 10875H in the Concept D7 Easel, that's a fair bit faster. In Premiere, it is the second slowest chip. Uh, I would uh, take these Premiere measurements with a grain of salt as uh, there is some discrepancy in how Premiere likes to use the graphics card, no matter what your setting is set to for that. But it, it goes to show you the sort of performance you're looking at here. Right, I'm glad that we got that out of the way. Let's talk about the laptop in particular. Despite being a more value-oriented machine, build quality is great. There isn't much flex to it, the hinge feels pretty good, if a touch wobbly on this desk, uh, and the, the keyboard, which you can actually see its uh, fancy translucent uh, switch covers on WASD, and you can see the, the scissor mechanism underneath, and its kind of lime green backlights, feels nice for both typing and gaming. The trackpad is about as big as you can expect for a gaming machine, and handles about as well as you can expect for a Windows one, so that's good there. You've also got reasonable I.O., including a Thunderbolt 3 port which offers USB PD charging, and inside there's even space for a second M.2 SSD if you want to upgrade later, and a SODEM RAM module to upgrade that too. You'll also notice a pretty great cooling solution. Plenty of heat sinks, of heat pipes and ventilation. The only downside is that the CPU, despite only drawing 63 watts under full load, still managed to hit 94 degrees Celsius and cut its boost off pretty heavily, but the GPU, which drew 91 watts, stayed relatively frosty at about 75 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be much shielding between the heatsink and the keyboard deck, which means that there's a lot of heat transfer. Anything past the T key was pretty much unbearable, and the region just above the keyboard, that was running a little over 50 degrees Celsius, or in other words, enough to burn you if you're not careful. And then there is the display. On the model I've got, it's a frankly incredible 240 hertz, three millisecond response time IPS panel that covers 100% of the sRGB spectrum. I like to commend companies for accurate marketing, which is what ASUS has done here. The sticker on the laptop says that it's a three millisecond panel, and it's exactly that. Black to white uh, covers in three milliseconds, and as usual, the white to black response time is a little slower, around 10 milliseconds, but it displays really minimal ghosting, one or two frames at most, and so is genuinely impressive. The problem is, the one that you can buy here in the UK has a 144 hertz panel instead. But that's not a big deal, right? I mean, it's still high refresh rates and you don't really need 240 hertz, so does it matter? Well, a closer look at their spec sheets reveals that the 144 hertz option is listed as a value IPS panel rather than the standard IPS level for the 240 hertz one. And that's reflected in its just 62.5% coverage of the sRGB spectrum. That means that it's likely a similar or the same panel I tore MSI a new one for including in their Bravo 15. That means horribly slow response times, a panel that you cannot do any level of color sensitive work on, and in fact I would steer clear of doing anything related to color on it, like video editing, uh, and would give you a visibly and significantly worse gaming experience. 
and yet it's being sold on the same machine as an amazing 240Hz panel. So to recap, you get why I'd argue is an i3 dressed as an i7, a 3070 that's half as fast as a desktop 3070, and if you don't buy the fancier 240Hz version, a display that will be a relatively bad gaming experience, all for more money than last year's model that might actually be faster in games. Can you see why I'm a bit upset here? The thing is, I really wanted to like this laptop. It seems like a fantastic deal from the outset, but when you look at it, it just doesn't really make sense. But the thing is, Asus, here's how you fix this. Bin that 144Hz panel that you're using and at least put in an equally good 144Hz panel to the 240Hz 40 hertz one you're using, or just bin that entirely and just ship it with this fantastic 240 hertz one instead. Swap the CPU for a 10750H. It's going to cost pretty much the same, but will give the people who are spending their hard earned money on these things enough headroom to say stream and record games, or just play games at higher FPS in general. And turn up the TDP of the 3070 just a little. It's clearly got enough thermal headroom as it was running well below its sort of target threshold, and so if you stick it to 90 watts and boost up to 95 instead, that could easily make it the best gaming laptop anyone could buy right now and an absolute no-brainer of a recommendation. But as it stands, I think I would honestly probably steer clear of this for now and pick something a little bit more well, balanced spec-wise. What's weird is that this could be, as specced as I have it, a fantastic esports gaming machine. I mean, the single-threaded performance of the CPU is actually one of the best laptop chips that I've tested, barring the new Ryzen ones, and so cu coupling that with the 240Hz display makes this an incredible machine to game on. Also, the input lag was ridiculously low for a laptop, so big thumbs up there, but the trouble is, that's not what this is marketed as. This is marketed as a standard great value gaming laptop, and as it stands, I just don't think it quite is that. Now with that said, those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. What do you think of the, the naming scheme woes from both Intel and Nvidia? What do you think about the panel choices and the uh, or discrepancy there? And what do you think about the laptop in general? I would love to hear your thoughts in those comments down below. As always, whether I like the laptop or like the products or not, I do leave a link to it in the description down below. That's an Amazon affiliate link that will take you to your local Amazon store. We can see pricing when and where you watch this because it can and does vary. And what spec is available in your region can vary too. So feel free to check that out while you're down there as well. There's also a whole load of other links in the description you can check out for ways to support me and the channel, uh, including things like Patreon for access to our Money Men Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and because I have a habit of making enemies, it can be very good for, uh, for having some independent support from people like you, so thank you very much to the patrons who are already there, and welcome to anyone who fancies joining. There's also merch hoodies or t-shirts like this one, or a load of other cool designs, and a load of other affiliate links for places like Overclock UK, there's VPN options, Hubble One, No Stream OBS, there's a load of stuff, so feel free to check it out. Otherwise, I'll leave some more videos on the end cards, including the laptop versus desktop GPU video for your easy viewing pleasure, um, and that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, do feel free to leave those in the comments down below. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.